Model Steam Engines Top Tip Time Part 52. This is quite a long episode as I describe how I made some parts for the reversing mechanism of a Stuart No. 7 steam engine. It's not difficult, but you have to keep your eye on the scale of things. If any of the parts are too big, it does in my opinion spoil the appearance. I want the parts to look neat and attractive and fully match the size of the parts already on the engine. The first thing to do is to remove the steam chest cover. This is held in place by six nuts on six studs. A quick word of warning when doing a job like this. It's not too bad disassembling the engine, but when I put it back together, please bear in mind that these are only 7BA bolts. They are very small and very thin, and very easy to strip or shear off. So don't put too much pressure on the job if you're assembling an engine. In between the steam chest cover and the main steam chest is a gasket anyway, so you don't need to really torque these bolts up. I've seen some horrendous examples in the past where studs have been stripped and then a fake bit of stud with a nut on it has been super glued in the hole. Most of the time this is down to inexperience. If someone's used to working on full size devices like motorcycle engines or car engines, then yes, you would use a torque wrench to really tighten the bolts, but not so on a miniature steam engine. Inside the steam chest is a gunmetal slide valve. This controls both the admission and exhaust of the steam. The driving bar looks to be a slack fit on this valve, and it's supposed to be. The slide valve needs to float freely in the steam chest, it's only the pressure of the steam that holds it in position. The main problem with this valve rod, apart from too much thread at the bottom end where it goes onto the fork, is that the top part of the thread won't let it travel any further than you see here, and that's not enough travel. This clip shows the new valve fork fitted to the old valve spindle. Supplied with this engine were some extra valve rods, and the one at the front of this image is the one that I'm going to use. As you can see in this clip, the valve spindle is just a little bit too long, because I don't want it to stick through and foul the expansion link. And so in the outer part of the workshop, I'm using my 1 inch belt sander to just shorten the thread very slightly so that when I put it back together this time, everything should be a perfect fit. In this clip, it looks like the valve spindle is a bit short, but it isn't. That's because the valve fork isn't tightened onto it. And here's a good tip for tightening valve forks onto spindles. Put the spindle in a drill chuck, and then use a barco spanner in the way that I've shown in a previous episode to tighten the valve fork or clevis onto the valve spindle. Because a lot of this valve fork is threaded, I can't just push it into the valve gland, so I'm screwing it in there, and that way the valve packing material won't be damaged. Moving down to the bottom of the engine, it's now time to set the eccentrics in the correct position, or at least the approximate correct position. I'm fixing them in position with the grub screw, with the flat side of the crank web corresponding to the largest lobe of the eccentric. Back up to the top of the engine, I'm having to physically hold the expansion link in the approximate position so I can rotate the crankshaft and move the valve up and down. This is only approximate because I haven't put the die block in place yet. I will adjust it later on once the die block's in place. I'm just having a look to see what the valve travels like. Because if these parts are not made correctly, then the valve event's never going to be right. But luckily on this engine, like everything else about it, it's well made. In the first episode, I showed a collection of parts from the tin. And in the top right of the picture is the basic piece of metal that's going to be trimmed to be the die block. I carefully trimmed it to the right size because it's far too long in its original state using my one inch belt sander. And here you can see it in position once it has been trimmed to size. It's always a good idea to make sure the die block is not too long and doesn't hit the internal part of the expansion link as the expansion link moves across it. Here I'm using a needle file to centralise the die block so I can put the bolt in there. Here's a close up shot of the valve travel now. The edges of the ports look a little bit raggy, that's because they're cast in, but it really doesn't matter, that is unimportant. As you can see, the valve still needs some adjustment. It's uncovering the top port a little too much, but not uncovering the bottom port enough. What I need to do is remove the bolt, remove the die block, and rotate the valve rod anti clockwise to allow for the valve to be centralised over the ports. 
I thought I would take this opportunity to apply some oil to lubricate the moving parts of the reversing gear. It is essential that this expansion link, the steel part, slides very smoothly from side to side over the die block. If you rewind and look at the valve fork you will see that that's been filed at either end so that it doesn't foul at the top and nothing's fouling in the middle. The expansion link slides very freely all the way across the die block at any position of the crankshaft and this is what I need it to do. You will notice that some of the components are completed and others are not. Most of them are just part made. I'm just checking that all the components that have been part made have been part made correctly. There is an error though, if you look at this drop arm, it's wrong. The hole at one end should be smaller than the other, but it's not a big problem. I'll fit a phosphor bronze bush to repair the error. I need to make the reversing lever, because that's one part that hasn't been made. And normally the reversing lever is a gunmetal casting. I'm going to fabricate it using a piece of brass. For the lever arm, I'm using this piece of brass that I found. It's not quite the right size, but by the time I've machined it down, it should work fine. As this reversing arm is a fabrication, I'm going to silver solder a phosphor bronze bush into a large hole at the end of it. And with a bit of luck, it's in the middle. Not bad, as I drilled this hole entirely by eye, using no scientific equipment whatsoever, except for my calibrated eye. Which is working well today, it doesn't always work out like this. I was going to machine this to make the bush, but it's not very good, the hole's not in the middle, so I'll throw that in the bin, and here is a piece of proper phosphor bronze in the chuck, and this is much better, it's more than large enough to turn down to get a perfect fit for the bush that I'm going to fit in the hole in the piece of brass that you've just seen me drill. You've just been watching me machining this bush, and it's oversized for a reason which will become apparent later. I drilled the hole down the centre, one imperial size less than 5 30 seconds of an inch, and then I used the 5 30 seconds of an inch reamer to get an accurate hole. And now in this clip I'm parting off the finished component and I'm letting it fall into the chip tray as the chip tray is quite clean, which makes a change. And now I'm going to try out my new brazing hearth in the outer part of the workshop. So first of all, I spread the silver solar flux onto the part and the flux is easy flow number two. And now using my blowtorch, I'm going to heat the part up until it glows red. I'm watching the flux as a good guide when silver soldering, watch the flux and when it takes on a watery appearance, that's the time to just touch the silver solder stick on the joint and the silver solder flashes all the way around the joint. After the silver solder flashes around the joint, hold the heat on for a very short time and then let it all cool to black. By speeding up the video, it's now cooled to black, so I'm going to quench it in a pot of water. This is not acid, it's just ordinary water that I keep in a plastic tub right next to where I silver solder. What I need to do is fit a milling cutter and use it to machine the reversing lever to the correct thickness. Here's the milling cutter, quite a big one, and it's fitted into an R8 collet, which holds it very securely. This clip shows the fabricated reversing lever clamped securely in the machine vise. All I have to do now is just mill across the top and cut it to size. Unfortunately, the camera moved, so I didn't get that shot very well. And now I don't need the boss to fit into the chuck, I can chop it off. And for this I'm using my old Burgess bandsaw. After rounding the end of the piece of bar, I'm generally cleaning it up on the one inch belt sander, followed by various grades of wet to dry sandpaper and a quick touch on the polishing spindle. The lever's not the right shape though, it needs to be tapered with a bit of a bulge in the middle where the hole is. And in this clip, I'm applying quite a lot of marking out blue. I can never get this quite right, the brush is a little bit on the stiff side, so it always puts too much on. Now it's time to make the pair of links that will pull the expansion link across the slot in the valve fork. These components are part finished. I don't know why the builder didn't drill the holes through the spacers when he made them. I'm going to have to do this, and also they're actually the wrong size. They're a bit too big, I'm going to have to machine a bit off them. On one side of the levers, the spacer needs to be even smaller. I'm going to do the first job wrong. Not that I'm stupid, you understand, but sometimes it's a good idea to show the wrong way to do it, and what will happen if you do it the wrong way very much like a beginner would probably do it. So here's the part held in the chuck by the very small bit at the end. I'm trying to avoid facing across the end which will put too much pressure on the piece. Instead I'm taking small cuts from right to left, which in theory will not put quite as much pressure on this small component. 
Don't forget this part is only held in the chuck by the very end part and that is very small. So far so good, but when I get near the middle, watch. The part comes loose in the chuck. Why didn't the part come loose in the chuck right at the beginning of the job? It's all a matter of speeds and feeds relative to the diameter of the piece and where the lathe tool is at any given time. I've refitted the part into the chuck but I'm holding it by the main body so it's not going to jump out of the chuck this time. So what happened before? Well it's all a question of speeds and feeds. If you think about it, the chuck is revolving at a constant speed. So the metal is going past the tool on the outer diameter much faster than it does when the tool gets nearer the centre. Maybe if I'd been more gentle with the tool and taken finer cuts near the centre, I wouldn't have had the problem. But it's never a good policy to hold a part by a very small protrusion that is too small to give it the correct mechanical support. Apart from leaving these parts oversized, the original builder did not drill the hole down the centre. So I'm doing that on all four of them, starting with the centre drill and following through with the number 40 twist drill, which is clearance size for 7BA. The size of stud I'm going to be using to hold these parts together. A couple of things to do to the pieces of flat bar, first of all clean them up on some wet or dry sandpaper and countersink the holes at one side very slightly using a twist drill. Not only will this allow the small parts to fit perfectly against the pieces of flat bar, it will give a bit of a reservoir for some extra Loctite. I'm using Loctite 603 here and from my experience this is a better method than silver soldering the bars. Once I'd applied the Loctite to both of the small barrels and fitted them to the bar, I temporarily fitted them into my vise and applied some pressure to hold them together until the Loctite had set. And as you can see, when I tighten the vise, some Loctite runs out of the joint. After the Loctite had cured on the first part, I clamped the second part in the vise in exactly the same way. About an hour later, I started the big cleanup. As well as making the parts look good, I'm making sure that none of the barrel sticks out of the other side. Time now to trim off the excess at the end of the bars. A very easy job, first of all using my bandsaw followed by my 1 inch belt sander. To remove all the tool marks, I polish them using the polishing spindle. The drawing probably assumes that you're going to use a casting. But a lot of builders would probably make these parts as I'm doing. It's quite difficult to hold these parts in position to illustrate what I'm doing. I've reduced the width of the two barrels only at one end to allow the drop arm to fit in between because the drop arm is wider than the expansion link. Here we go again, one more time. I'm doing something wrong to illustrate how you should not do the job. I need to machine a piece of phosphor bronze to make a bush for the oversized hole in the drop arm. And initially I was taking far too great a cut. That's why the tool was jumping about. And don't forget, as I've previously mentioned, as you move towards the centre of a piece of work, it slows down. So therefore you have to slow your cut down as well, if you want to get a good finish. For instance, if you put a piece of bar in the chuck and take a really fast cut down it, you're not going to get a good finish, even at the outside diameter. Unless the piece of bar in the chuck is revolving at a very high speed. So don't forget, the general rule is, the less of the diameter, the less of the surface speed. But if the chuck is fitted with a larger diameter piece of metal, then the surface speed may be excessive. To allow for parting off, I'm just taking off a bit more of the metal. It will make parting off slightly easier. And now, as you can see, I have plenty of tolerance. What I'm doing here is trying the drop arm in position and then setting the parting tool to cut the bush to the correct length. A short while ago, I showed the drilling process using a centre drill first, followed by a number 40 drill, which is clearance size for a 7BA stud. A number 40 drill is definitely a clearance size for a 7BA bolt, but it's a tight clearance size. But that's what's shown on the Stuart model's drawing, so who am I to argue with that? I'm sure it will all wear together once it starts to run. Until all of these parts are held together in the bracket and fitted with the reversing arm, it's quite difficult to move the expansion link back and forth, but there's nothing wrong with the expansion link and the valve fork, I've already tested that. It's just a bit difficult to keep everything in alignment at this stage with everything being loose. I'll have a look and see whether a standard Stuart stud for holding a steam chest to a cylinder fits across this part. If it does, then that's what I'll use. If it doesn't, then I'll have to make my own. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. 
please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.